Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor all over them. back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Now before I start this video, it's important for me to mention that the author does not seek to discredit any previous accounts or versions of events leading up to the gruesome murders. He merely offers an interesting alternative scenario to be considered. Bill and the team had missed the four o'clock afternoon get-together in the office that day, but were told that nothing much happened, apart from the intel on Clive. He was told Tucker hadn't paid the interest for the first month of his loan, but Bill already knew that from his own intel on Tucker. There was nothing to report on what Clive had planned. On his general form, he would be firm and polite in the early stages, so nothing to trouble Bill's watch just yet. Tate went around to see Steele on the Friday morning at the end of the week, it was a short visit and no one knew what was said. They must have talked outside, maybe in the garden or driveway. Steele's phone got nothing and Tate must have left his in the car. Tucker had called in some of his closest foot soldiers on the Wednesday morning before and just after the Heathrow meeting was discussed with Pat and Craig. Tony told them all to collect in as much cash as they could from what was owed and to lean on anyone who was poncing about. Monday the following week for the branch team, and the weekend had been business as usual for the Essex boys on Bill's watch. After going through the audio and location intelligence collected by the tech boys at GCHQ over the weekend, Bill listened to a call that Tucker had received from a phone box in the Loughton area. The voice was quiet and unassuming, but unmistakable if you had listened to as many recordings of the voice as the branch team had. It wasn't menacing in its sound or content, yet it was menacing to all who heard it, as they all knew whom it belonged to. It had a politeness which belayed the wicked in the man. Hello, mate. Have you got a problem? It was neither a question nor a statement. It was whatever you didn't want it to be. Tony Tucker had paused for just too long. No, mate. I'll get in touch with him and get it sorted. He didn't put a sorry in. It would have sounded weak. It made no difference to the caller. He didn't care either way. He had done his bit and Tony had committed to do something for the second time now. What Tucker did next was call Tate. Oh, he's been on the phone, we need to sort that bit for them old wankers. Fuck him, they can wait if he comes down here, they can come and see me. You won't fucking see him coming, Pat. Fuck him, we get this cunt in Holland sorted and we won't need their fucking money, and then when the time comes, perhaps we should make some general changes to the management in Essex. Tony had ended the call. He would see Pat later that evening. Bill could only imagine Tucker's predicament. He was also none the wiser from the weekend's intel to if any progression was being made towards the next shipment. Nothing had been mentioned specifically so far. Tate had ranted about the lack of action, but that told him nothing he needed to know. Meanwhile, Tucker had his eyes set firmly on a nice comfortable profit, making maximum revenue from a profitable drugs business in the clubs he controlled in Essex, and not having to have a run-in with the region's dark destroyer. And now, here in his own backyard, he had partnered himself up with a man who was steadily becoming more and more of a liability. Yes, Pat had good ideas and he had brought Mickey and the Dutchman to the table. Yes, the pills were the best they'd ever had if they could get the next parcel in and he'd give the old boys back the hundred grand as soon as he could. But he hadn't liked the call from Loughton. It unsettled him more than he cared to admit. A chill went through him when he thought about the caller. What Tony Tucker needed was just a bit longer. No bad luck and it would all be all right. He was getting closer and closer to the good life. Maybe, if they made enough money, he would move himself out to Marbella. He liked it out there. Craig could handle things back here, and hopefully Pat would settle down a bit, maybe lay off the gear. He was hitting it too hard, and it was making him very unpredictable. Just no bad luck. That's all Tony needed. He told himself over and over. He didn't even need good luck. 
it should all work out for him fine if he didn't have any bad luck. Tony had scraped together the 30 grand and Pat dropped it round to Mickey on the Friday. They should have the pills for the next weekend and he'd get the monkey off his back before he got too comfortable there. He'd get the 10 grand to the old wankers two weeks late. He'd pay a fine. They'd be happy with that. And as soon as he could, he'd clear the bill. Tony didn't like that phone call on Sunday. Something unnatural about that man. Pat was no match for him. I mean, maybe in a straightener, Pat was a bear of a man and had the heart of a lion in a fight. But he wouldn't see it coming. Tony understood that, even if Pat didn't. Bill was working at the regular pace now with the two detective constables. Maintaining real time was tiring, and it was easy to miss the bigger picture. Tuesday and Wednesday were regular days. The afternoon sessions were productive in their own way. Some of the other players in the surrounding areas were talking about the Basildon crew, who had some good pills on the way, and there was the usual interest. It was drugs business as normal for Essex and the rest of the green and pleasant land. Bill was working hard on his intel, trying to get a handle on when Steele would be going to Holland. The man appeared to lead a fairly quiet personal life, and as far as Bill could work out, he was waiting on the go-ahead from the Dutchman. Well, that's what he had told Pat in a short phone call that Pat had made to him on the Saturday. Mickey had cut Pat short on the phone and said, I told you they'll be in touch as soon as. Patience is a virtue, Pat. And with that, he'd hung up on Tate, who had then ranted to no one in particular. He was going to kill the man and soon. Thursday afternoon and Bill had nothing on Steele's imminent departure for Holland, or so he thought. He was just finishing up on a couple of the foot soldiers' phone traffic, all from the day before, and getting ready for the afternoon roundtable session on the Essex's crime activities when he found it. The pills were home. They were in the UK. The guys were moving them around and there was nothing on Steele. He hadn't given them anything to work with. Had he managed to go to Holland and come back with the pills without the branch team knowing a thing? Bill brought it up as a major concern at the meeting. Still, was giving them nothing to work with, and he was flying well under their radar. After several reruns through what he had on Pat Tate for the week, Bill and Tony Furman found it. A call from a public phone box to Tate, telling him the little fellas were home, and when did he want to come round and get them. It had been made to Tate's burner phone on Monday afternoon from a phone box at the Marks Tay services on the A12 between Chelmsford and Colchester. The voice could be Steele's. Tate had replied, the lads will be over there in the morning. Tate had then arranged for two foot soldiers to come and see him that evening. The meeting hadn't flagged up as anything significant and there was no audio on what had transpired. Whatever had gone on, the pills were now moving around the supply network and would be in the clubs for the weekend. The parcel was twice the size as before and would keep Middle Essex buzzing for a couple of weeks at least. Spendlove arrived mid-morning at Atlanta Boulevard on the Friday, and he had DCI Edwards in tow. OK, Bill, I had the port check this morning. It appears our Mickey, well, the boat he's involved with, went out on Sunday. It came back in sometime on Monday. Plenty of time for him to have gotten over there and loaded himself up from his Dutchman. Looking at the timings on the call to Mr Tate to advise him of the arrival of the little fellas, well, let's just say I believe it's a certainty that that's what he's done. DCI Edwards opened the meeting. The stuff's here all right, and from what I had this morning, Tucker and Tate have been invited to Amsterdam to meet with a Dutchman. Looks like they're all going on Monday, Steel as well. Bill had been focusing hard on Tony and Pat all morning. Okay, this importation setup of Steel's, it needs to be checked. Problem is, we are missing him on our normal method of observation. So we're going to initiate a regular procedure involving the Essex and Suffolk police forces on a combined operation. It's not a big port, so there is no reason to involve the glory boys at customs, who are at best unpredictable. There were noticeable groans in the room as Superintendent Spendlove broke the news. I know, I know, we never get to be at the sharp end, but you all know this is about results and not who gets the collar. Now the DCI will run through what we hope to achieve and what we are looking for from the operation because if this plays out how we want it then it will push your Essex boys who we are now most interested in to get more involved with the importation side, not less. Hopefully then we will be able to wrap them up as a neat little parcel for our friends at Essex Police. Again there was another audible groan but it was much lighter hearted. 
Now, we have initiated sufficient intelligence to convince Essex and Suffolk police that Mickey Steele and persons unknown are about to ship out to Holland and return with a quantity of drugs on board. Now, this team will more than likely do things the old-fashioned way and have eyes of surveillance on Mickey Steele and his boat. Let's hope they don't blow it. This will ultimately lead to a nice reception party, all waiting for him when he returns with the next batch of product for his pals here in Essex. Now, we are not involving the Dutch police in this, so in effect, what will happen is Mr. Steele will be removed from the equation. The seizure and his arrest will take place at the first available opportunity, so hopefully the next run, which I assume will be in around a week or so, gentlemen. DCI Edwards looked around the room. Bill and the other team members nodded in agreement. It was what they would expect. It had worked for Steele twice already, and it wouldn't be long before the hungry customers in Essex needed more good time gear. It should be an easy result for the regular boys and make them look good in the war on drugs. Still, and whoever went with him would be looking at a decent holiday with Her Majesty's prison service. You've been listening to the book Once Upon a Time in Essex. This book is available to purchase online at Amazon and other online book retailers. Many thanks for joining me for this video. Very shortly you'll be able to see some other videos from the channel, including the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.